Welcome to the sweet 16th episode of Look, Look and Look Again. Well, do you remember Spangles? Do you remember Chopper Bikes? Good, good. How about Lookin' Magazine? Oh, you do? Well, that's just swell. Well, you might remember our next review, fondly remembered by many of a certain era. Without further ado... On look, look, and look again. It's... Let's pick up from where Ace of Wands left off in our premiere episode of Look, Look and Look Again, shall we? Do you remember that one? So Ace of Wands reached an abrupt ending with a bang and then a new program started in its place. 1973 saw the arrival of a race of telepaths on the ITV network as Thames Television brought us the adventures of the Tomorrow People. The show, which ran for eight seasons between 1973 and 1978, brought us such fondly remembered terminology with things such as breaking out and jaunting and captured the imagination of children everywhere. Although degenerating towards the end of its tenure, where at the beginning it brought us scary elements as this... To such embarrassments as this. In time to save your world from annihilation by the Thargons. However, we cannot guarantee to always be here in sufficient strength to defeat any future attacks. You must prepare to defend yourselves. Uh, forgive me, but... Uh... One could never accuse the show of being boring and always provided the audience with pure adventure, which pitted a race of telepaths against all sorts of adversaries, whether homegrown or from other worlds. The premise of the 1970s show saw three Tomorrow people called John, Carol and Kenny already evolved into Homo Superiors from Homo Novus, helping young Steve and Jameson break out. Breaking out is when a potential Tomorrow person needs a bit of TLC in completing the last steps into reaching their next level of evolutionary development. A bit like a butterfly needing help out of its chrysalis. If successful, John, the eldest, would take the new Tomorrow person under his wing and develop them with paranormal and telekinetic ability. Although blessed, or cursed depending on your viewpoint, with such skills the Tomorrow people operate from their base in a desolate, unused underground tube station in the United Kingdom's capital city of London. Breaking out is never easy, though, as the uh, Tomorrow person has to endure severe mental anguish as their state of mind undergoes a radical change as part of their evolvement. And they run the risk of teleporting all over the place without the assistance of a jaunt belt, which can place them in jeopardy, especially if they were to jaunt into the vacuum of space. Without it, without the jaunt belt, or later a jaunt bracelet, after the belt was phased out at the end of season 5, the Tomorrow person runs the risk of severe instability. Such is the fate, a uh, few times of Stephen, in the first story, The Slaves of Jedekiah, which sees a shape-shifting alien called Jedekiah kidnapping Stephen with the help of two buffoons, as it needs Stephen's telepathic powers to power its master's ship. The Tomorrow People are good eggs, really, as they are pacifists without the ability to kill and only to stun when in danger. 
Being evolutionarily superior, John and his peer group are pretty clever dudes and in their underground lair have the savoir dire to create the ultimate computer, by 1973 standards, whom they call Tim. Tim is not only mechanical, for seemingly he is fused with organic elements and is referred to as a biotronic computer who can provide vital information necessary to combat the foes of the Tomorrow People and assist in locating other Tomorrow People too, whom I will now refer to as TPs going forward, as keep saying Tomorrow People is a bit of a mouthful. When they break out and are in desperate need of being located, Tim steps in and homes in on their locations for the others to find them. Tim's other functions are to enhance and amplify the TP's powers, especially their psychic ability, and it's paramount when it comes to ensuring our TP troop have the capabilities of jaunting to much greater distances. It's all right. There's nothing to be frightened of. Stephen, listen to me. I want to help you, but I can't unless you come back. Please, Stephen, come back. Stephen, please come back. You've got to come back. If you don't, you'll die. You'll die. You'll die. You'll die. You'll die. Stop it. Stop it. Do you hear? Hello. I'm Carol. There's nothing to worry about. You're quite safe. You're in a hospital. What's happening? Deep think linking. It's a technique we have. It increases our perception enormously. What do you want me to do? I want you to think back, Stephen. Think back to last night. Last night. Last night. Last night. Nothing is wasted here. Now to follow. Apple crumble, ice cream. Nothing more for me, thanks, Tim. No. 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 As well as Tim, our TPs also have affiliations with the Galactic Federation, or as it is sometimes referred to, the Galactic Trig, who get in touch from time to time when things get totally out of hand, and both TPs and the Galactic Trig end up relying on each other and combining forces against an array of otherworldly menaces. They played a bigger part in future stories as the series progressed, and usually when there is a cast change, instead of a character swan song story, the tale tells us that the Tomorrow person has gone off to join them. So, how about the origins? Well, it is all to do with Mr. Roger Price. Mr. Price was the brainchild of the Tomorrow People and visualised the series as far back, so sources indicate, as 1970. It took Mr. Price three years to get the project off the ground. Initially, Price offered the concept of the programme to Granada Television, where he worked, but there was a slight disinterest. Southern Television was the next regional company whom Price approached, and they showed far better enthusiasm, but identified one major burden. Finances. In 1971, whilst Price continued his job as a, as a director at Granada Studios, he was tasked to direct a show featuring this guy. And whilst the seeds of the Tomorrow People were still germ germinating in Price's brain, he chatted to David Bowie and mentioned the term homo superior. Bowie, according to Price, liked this term very much and used it in Oh You Pretty Things in 1971. So we could say that the Tomorrow People concept inspired a pop icon as Bowie popped the term into the song. 
We can also find the genesis of the term homo superior in a 1935 science fiction story called Odd John, written by Olaf Stapledon. And in fact, in this novel, it is where it was first used. I find Homo Superior much more alluring than Ubermensch, to be honest. Stapledon's book can be considered an influence on the show, as it features a supernormal human who conflicts with the ordinary citizen in this tale. This is quite similar to the TPs, who tend to try and stay out of the public eye as much as possible for fear of being caught and whisked off to a lab to be experimented upon by men in white coats. This nightmare actually takes place in the brilliant story Secret Weapon, but more on that later. Anyway, Price had a fortunate coincidence as Thames Television were looking for something to fill the gap which was going to be left by Ace of Wands as it was fast approaching the end of its three-year tenure and uh, requested a possible answer to BBC One's Doctor Who. So, using connections within TV land, Price found an inlet to realise his dream, and the Tomorrow People found the backers to produce it. Enter television producer Ruth Boswell, who was assigned to be the show's associate producer due to her extensive experience with children's television fantasy drama. Boswell had already had a hand in another piece of kid alt retro gold called Time Slip. As Price had very little experience in writing drama, TV dramatist Brian Finch was brought in to assist him, and finally the talents of one-time Doctor Who director Paul Bernard was brought in to oversee and assist in the inauguration of the programme. Bernard also was the person responsible for those fantastic opening credits which accompany Dudley Simpson's otherworldly score. With this setup, the Tomorrow People jaunted onto our screens in the United Kingdom on Monday the 30th of April 1973 to an enchanted tea time audience. Casting was important to Price, and he favoured a relatively pleasant-looking cast for the leads, although one of the leads' acting's credibility leaves a lot to be desired. The first was a uh, male lead called um, for the for the um, part of John, and that uh, went to Nicholas Young, whose pre-TP CV includes 1969's Haunted House of Horror and To Sir With Love, although these were uncredited bit parts. Peter Vaughan Clark was uh, spotted by Price in a production of Peter Pan and offered him the role, which he accepted. The role of Carol was initially going to be offered to Peter Sellers' wife, Lynn Frederick, at the behest of associate producer Boswell, but was considered too effete for the role by others involved in the casting. Enter Sammy Windmill, who played Nurse Crumpton in the Doctor at Large sitcom, and she was finally cast in the role of Carol. Philip Gilbert, a theatre actor, was commissioned to play Computer Tim, and in a moment of what the fuck were they thinking of, the role of Kenny was given to Stephen Salmon after he was discovered in a drama workshop. Such is the abysmal thespian abilities by the actor, he is mainly throughout the first season relegated to the confines of the Tomorrow People's base, and his whines to John of, why can't I come, really make you hope and pray John will turn round one day and say, because wood cannot jaunt. There is bad acting, and uh, bad acting, and this is bad, with a capital B, but bloody funny nevertheless. Sources indicate that uh, young Salmon wasn't really interested in acting at all, and this clearly shows. This one is suitable. Keep him ready. Hey, you all right, kid? Yeah, I'm all right. Listen, what happened back there? I don't remember. Well, try and remember. We've got to find our way out of this place before Tinka and Tommy comes back and really starts playing rough. Hey, Lefty, you think what I'm thinking? Hey. Eh? Just have to take our chance about him not being out there, won't we? question is, which one opens the door? 
Now, you're a bright kid killer. Which one do you think? You're wasting your time. Attention, everyone. I have an unidentified signal coming in on channel four. Did you? No, audio. Greetings. Who are you? I am Cyclops. What have you done with Kenny? No harm will come to your friend if you obey instructions. What instructions? You possess a matter transmitter in your laboratory. So? You will please take note of the following coordinates. 439QR to the sign 976. The first season of The Tomorrow People comprised of three stories totaling 13 episodes. The first being The Slaves of Jedekiah, which is pretty decent, but let down by an atrocious robot menace which resembles egg boxes sprayed silver. One, can help, one cannot help grin at its overall charm, though. This five-parter sees the TPs against Jedekiah, who was going to appear more frequently than he was eventually used, as the arch-nemesis akin to Doctor Who's The Master. He's played superbly by Francis DeWolf and brings gravitas to the role which DeWolf is noted for. DeWolf is known for his starring roles in the British cinematic horror genre in such gruel as Corridors of Blood and grisly little pot boilers as Hammer's lesser known outings such as The Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll and The Man Who Could Cheat Death. Remember we covered that in our Look Look Again episode of Miller the Stone Women and it was all about Hazel Court's tits as I recall. Who could forget them? Lovely they were. Shame I can't give you a glimpse on here but tits are a no-no. No. As well as a ton of uh, other roles that Francis de Wolfe appeared in other cult TV shows such as The Avengers, Doctor Who, The Saint and uh, the marathon cop serial Dixon of Doc Green. I love the idea that back in the day there wasn't the snobbery we have today as actors were willing to rub shoulders with complete novices and sometimes this is such a stark contrast as parts of the talent the talent that contrasts leapfrogs from awkward to admiration or bollocks to bravo depending on the uh, acting ability. I guess it's all about the paycheck or a genuine interest in the scripts and the story really whereas in this day and age most actors use programs as a vehicle vehicle to uh, climb up the career ladder. Anyway, the first shoot did not go too well at all, with the cast taking objection to the imperious attitude of Paul Bernard, who got quite a few backs up. Nicholas Young sustained minor injuries after hitting into a wall, and the first day in the studio yielded very little of material that could be used. The series also suffered from uh, rushed studio time and uh, this was also uh, due to the fact that there were legal issues which affected the amount of time juvenile actors could work per day. Even for its time, the special effects were considered slipshod, and this is evidence, but the uh, premise of the story and the imaginative direction overrides such affectations. Despite this, Slays of Jedekiah provides pretty solid drama and is an enjoyable slab of sci-fi on the cheap, ideal for the young audience who simply wanted to be entertained at tea time. Two other regular characters, Bikers Ginger and Lefty, are introduced and ultimately come good in the end. At first they take the role as Jedekiah's henchmen, but become the TP's muscle going forward. It doesn't matter, I'm here to help you. Really. Stephen, look at me. Look carefully into my eyes. Now, do you trust me? Yes. Good. Now, I want you to do something. Just try and relax. And imagine that your mind is a fist. A great big fist, clenched tight. Now, let it open. Slowly. No, don't let any other thoughts come into your head. Just think of the fist opening very slowly, like a flower. I can feel you right here inside my head. What's happening? You're becoming one of us. Who's us? The tomorrow people. The tomorrow people. Who is 
I will show you with I mean no harm. John, Carol, my sinus band has dropped off. Are you all right now? Fine. The control channel was thrown completely out of phase when the ship lurched. Now, be still! <laughs> Second floor room, I think. Is there a window? Yes, yeah, a small one with bars on it. Hang on, I'll try and show you which one. Jaunted. Jaunted? It means teleporting, instantaneous transmission of a body from one section of space to another. It's a smashy way of getting around. Just wait till you learn it. I'll never be able to appear just like that. Yes, you will. All tomorrow people have the ability. It's one of our talents. Though we need Look, a bit we'll of a power. We'll talk about that later. we better get a move on before those thugs get here. Yeah. Grab the door! We see the outside! Jaunt, everybody. The second story was called The Medusa Strain of four episodes, which really followed on from the first and sees a surprisingly convoluted plot involving altering history and about timelines. And it introduces the character of Peter, a young time guardian who is manipulated by Count Rabowski, who is determined on stopping the Tomorrow People's great emergence in the 21st century by using Peter to alter history itself. There's also a plot about stealing the crown jewels as well, so that's chucked in for good measure. Rabowski uses the Medusa of the title, who feeds on telepaths to threaten the Tomorrow People and render them telepathically inept. And so the, uh, the creature is kept in close proximity to block their telepathic links with each other. <clears throat> the creature itself is um, absolutely hysterical, especially in some chase sequences on the underground when it's speeded up. And um, this really does go towards this story's retro charm. It's not a bad attempt overall, but um, I think they're definitely saving the best till last. AD became quite well known earlier on as Adolf Hitler. Well, how do you do it? How does one travel into years that have already gone? I'll show you. This is a time key. It can open the time lanes that lead back to the dawn of man and beyond. Is it working? Oh, yes, it's working all right. Well, what's keeping you then? I can't operate it. The controls of a time key only work for a telepath. Then we must get hold of one. Come with me. By the way, what should I call you? Two. What an interesting beast. How did it develop these abilities? On his native planet, where it preys on little telepathic creatures. It uh, eats them. More precisely, it uh, sucks out their brains. It's not fussy. It'll do the same for human telepaths, given the chance. And while the Medusa stays near him, the boy cannot communicate telepathically. Capital. Forgive my asking, but why don't you get the boy to guide you down the time lane? Well, the boy doesn't like me for some reason. Do you? 
as the air drains from the airlock, the balloon expands and it Simple. And of course, the same thing would apply to a human being put in there. If they didn't have a space suit on. Yeah, you can put me in there, I still won't tell. Oh, no, not you, Peter, you're far too valuable. <laughs> Get in. Oh, no! Let me go, let me go. She hasn't got a space suit on, she'll die. That is correct. Unless you tell me, Peter. Peter, don't tell him whatever happens. Finally, we reach the end of the season, and definitely the best was saved until last. The Vanishing Earth introduces the Spydron, who is mining Earth's precious minerals and causing natural disasters as a consequence. Kevin Stoney, he played Tobias Vaughan against Troughton's Doctor in 1968's The Invasion, and Mavic Chen before that in the William Hartnell story The Dalek master plan. In this he plays Professor Steen who befriends the Tomorrow People and help them defeat the Spydron played by John Woodnut. Who to Who fans played against Tom Baker's Doctor in the excellent terror of the Zygons. What a connection all these uh, programs have and films really. John Woodnut and um, Kevin Stoney are both brilliant actors, um, it has to be said. The story um, also introduced the Galactic Federation for the first time, and the Spydron is possibly the most scariest of the adversaries who, uh, who the Tomorrow People come across, and seems to be a cross between a ghostly phantom and a member of the Ku Klux Klan. I don't know what you're talking about. Here, we're closed. You're trespassing. Go on, up it. Or I'll have the law on you. We'll save you the trouble. Carol, go and call the police. Yes. Hey, hold on, hold on. There's no need for that. Listen, I've had enough of this. This ain't my game. It's all turning dead weird. It ain't got nothing to do with me. It's all down to her. She's a human. She even laughed while she did it. Did what? What have you done to him? I told you I'd done nothing. It was her. She stunned him with his funny gun of hers and then slung him into the sea. The sea? Come on, Carol. That should do it, I think. Gateway one, a spider on gateway one, a spider on. Listen, clever dick, there's someone there, and there, at the top gate, but it's a matter transmitter. Oh, very interesting! Oh. That friend of yours, the galactic copter I told you about, him and some others. Some others! That's right, there's a bird there, and all shouting her mouth off. Now look, Spider, and I want out. Just give me my money, and I'll go. Eliminate him! Patience, my dear. Patience. You're much too valuable, Smithers. I promise I won't tell no one nothing. I wouldn't let me friends down, you know, let him. Don't let him go. Very well, Smithers, but before we settle up finally, I want you to tell me what you told that friend of mine. I didn't tell him nothing, did I? I refused to talk, didn't I? And what exactly did you refuse to tell him? The whole that stuff about a nightmare I... I see! Ready, everybody? Check. 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 Here we go. Spydron's down there now. Well, no, I don't think it's likely. Why? Because the bed of a river may be a convenient place to park, but it isn't a very convenient place from which to operate. I'd say if his ship is down there, Spydron's somewhere nearby, but on shore. Presumably underground. Yes. Goodbye, 